How's it going, dudes? Welcome to the worst board game of all time community tournament selection show, where we will start the contest to determine the worst of the worst while giving you the opportunity to predict the results and win a piece of vintage board gaming history. Hundreds of board games from around the world are aiming to qualify for the tournament and are currently glued to their screens waiting to see if they will make it in and have a shot at greatness. The National Board Game Association Selection Committee are making their final decisions now and should be revealing the final bracket shortly. Until then, I will give a quick rundown of how this works for those just tuning in. What we've got here is a single elimination bracket tournament where games will compete head to head in 1v1 matchups to determine which game is worse. Winners will move on to the next round with the process continuing until we get to the final and crown our champion. Lastly, I'll explain what those numbers were on the bracket for those that are unaware. These are seeds, which are used to rank a game on how well it's projected to do in the tournament. The lower a team's seed, the further they are expected to go. But just like in real life, numbers aren't everything. So don't fill out your bracket with just the lowest seeds moving on, because upsets are bound to happen. And with that, I'm getting word that the picks are in. The 64 teams that will be competing for the title have been finalized. Let's head over to the big bracket to learn who's made it in and who will be left at home. Looking at the stink region first, let's meet the number one overall seed in the tournament, War! This classic 1v1 card matchup will see you attempt to draw a card that's higher than your opponent's, while occasionally getting into the titular War, which will put more cards on the line. The game has plenty of critics, citing the lack of actual player involvement in the game and the fact that it takes an extremely long period of time to play a game this simple. But with any game, War has its defenders, who enjoy the easy-to-understand rules and gameplay and the fact that when a war happens, it is genuinely a tension-filled experience. It will be matched up with the number 16 seed of this region, Mega Nation. This 80s classic will see players attempt to dominate the world by acquiring the most important nations around the globe while attempting to bankrupt their opponents. This game struggles mainly due to the limited amount of mechanics that the game has for how long it takes to play, as well as suffering from the classic Monopoly endgame syndrome of just going around the board until someone gets unlucky enough to finally lose. However, with the Monopoly negatives come the Monopoly benefits, as the game's initial scramble for countries can be hectic and entertaining, while also enjoying the cards that can often shake up the game state. Up in our next matchup, we will see the number 8 seed, NBC, the TV news game. This title from 1962 offers trivia for players from the time period as they try to move around the board while also being overlooked by famous NBC News anchor Chet Huntley. The game features the same negatives suffered by many trivia titles, being nothing but a roll the dice and answer a questions title. But it separates itself from the other titles in the genre due to its obtusely dull theming as well. But fans of the title will mention the fact that it is a pretty easy to understand title that doesn't take very long. And the age of the questions and the game actually add quite a bit of challenge to those seeking to become the best. It will be going up against the number 9 seed, Fact or Crap. This 2001 trivia title challenges players to determine whether a statement is truly fact or if it is truly crap while attempting to gather all of the tokens from the middle pile. The game's haters draw ire from the fact that this is really just a true or false quiz with a funny name, and that there are no other mechanics other than you answer a question, then the next question is read off, and then you answer it. Fans of the game, however, love the fast-paced environment of everyone competing to answer the question at the same time, as well as the Rush Hour cards being able to shake up the gameplay a little bit and add some variety. Our next matchup will feature the number 5 seed, LCR. Also known as Left Center Right, this 1983 title will have you and friends rolling the dice to see who can gather all of the tokens. The game's critics will point to the fact that this description is all you do in the game, and that players can do nothing other than roll the dice, see what happens, and then have the next player roll the dice, and see what happens. But fans of the game enjoy its low complexity and low commitment, making it a great option for parties or gatherings due to its high energy. LCR will be competing against the number 12 seed, the Campaign for North Africa, The Desert War, 1940-43. to 43. 
This fan-favorite title has been declared the most complex war game of all time, and has earned that title vehemently due to the fact that no player has ever managed to finish a full game. The game's detractors mention that this title is over-complex to the point that no one can understand it, over-developed to the point that it is a chore to play it, and overloaded to the point where no one has ever finished it. But the game's many fans see it as a one-of-a-kind creation with nothing rivaling it, and the scale being a challenge for those brave enough to take it on. Next in the tournament, we meet the number four seed, Pug U. This 2018 title aims to create a fun environment around a group where you try to insult your friends and see which person gets insulted the most. Unfortunately, the game's haters will point out that the game fails to do this correctly and instead just creates a mean-spirited environment. In tandem with the fact that the game features several mechanics that are altogether pointless or don't contribute at all to the gameplay. This title will be up against another canine competitor in the number 13 seed, Doggy Doo. This popular 2010 kids game sees players attempt to collect the poop before their opponents can, and win if they can collect all three pieces. The game's critics despise the fact that this theme gets old very fast, as well as featuring little to no gameplay, just rolling the dice and seeing if you get to collect the poo first. But the game's fans really enjoy the theming, as well as showcasing that the simple gameplay is very good for children of all ages to understand. With the top half of the Stink region completed, let's head to the bottom half and meet our number two seed, Time Control. This 2003 title sees secret agents attempt to weaponize time against each other, using their combat ability to alter history. The game has been universally praised for its unique theming, unfortunately being equally as panned due to the terribly written rules, absurdly slow game speed, and mind-numbing PvP elements utterly squandering that inventive theme. But the game is not without its fans who enjoy hanging on to the time-based elements, as well as using the strategy and preventive thinking required to make the correct moves. It will be going up against the number 15 seed of the Mad Magazine game. This 1979 title sees players attempt to spend all of the money they start the game off with, including a ton of random elements based on the titular magazine. The game's detractors point to these random elements and mention how the novelty of them wears off quick, especially when no matter what you do in the game, a winner will basically be picked at random every time. And on to our next matchup, we have the number seven seed of Power Lunch. This 1994 title sees you attempt to sit celebrities from the time period at tables, and requires you to mention why this particular combination of people would be sitting together if you cannot get a correct match. The game's detractors mention that the over-reliance of celebrities from the 1994 time period have aged the game horribly, and that it's practically impossible to play with some combinations without looking up who the people are, because they're not famous anymore. However, the game's fans love the cool central mechanic, adding a social element to the rummy formula, as well as it being a great group game as long as you're allowed to look up who the people are. Power Lunch will be competing against the number 10 seed, 15 Love. This 1974 tennis title pits players against each other in a singles or doubles tennis match, and implements the tennis formula of returns, serves, and movements for your players through a dice rolling mechanic. The game's haters focus in on the fact that no matter what strategy you implement, it will always come down to a roll of the dice, as well as drawing particular attention to the fact that playing an entire full tennis match while doing nothing but rolling dice would be absolutely insane. The game's fans praise the game for being an incredibly creative way to implement tennis into a board game, and that the game rewards strategic thinking for where to put your players so that they can get the maximum chance of returning a shot. Meeting our next matchup, we have the number three seed of Public Assistance. The 1980 anti-welfare game has garnered tons of controversy due to its theming, even being banned at one point from stores. The game's haters point to the game's elements and theming being downright offensive at times, as well as being woefully unbalanced and relying far too much on luck to be enjoyable. But fans of the game point to the unique theme that isn't available anywhere else, and that the random elements can keep players invested even when they're woefully down. It will be going up against the number 14 seed, Bear Valley. 
This 2016 Press Your Luck title challenges players to find their way back to a campsite through a randomly generated forest. This design has garnered ire from players due to the strategic moves you make eventually coming down to only luck every time, and with haters particularly pointing out that the character skills somehow make the game worse by making it more complicated. However, fans of the game point to the base game being very well balanced with its risk-reward movement, and that you'll never be playing the same game twice due to the random map setup. And for our last matchup in the Stink region, we have the number 6 seed, the Worst Case Scenario Survival Game. This 2001 title from the popular book series sees players try to answer trivia questions to make it to the end of the map first. The game's detractors focus in on the fact that the game is violently boring, featuring only three total mechanics in the entire game, and also point out that many of the questions are so open-ended in their wording that multiple of the answers can be correct at once. However, fans of the game like to see the fun survival trivia and the quick pace at which the game moves as a good thing that improves the title with high replayability. It will be matched up against the number 11 seed, Sorry. This classic board gaming title sees players attempt to move all of their pieces around the board before their opponents can, impeding their progress along the way by stopping on the same spaces or sending them back to start through the titular Sorry cards. This wildly successful title has drawn plenty of criticism from the game's haters, being the fact that all you do in the game is draw a card and see what happens, and that the game can drag on for ages if players are not able to get the card that they need to move out from their spaces. But due to its widespread success, the game has plenty of defenders as well, as they see the title as having a good amount of strategy in choosing which pieces to move and how to get them into a favorable position, as well as keying in to the unpredictable nature of the game, forcing you to adapt to an ever-changing game state. Let's check in on the Classic Games Watch Party to see how they feel about Sari's inclusion. And it looks like they are loving it. Glad to see the games come together and support each other here, even dressing up in the same theme of their classic bookshelf attire. That is a paragon of sportsmanship right there. And that will round it out for the Stink Division. Let's take a look at some of the matchups and see if we have any way too early predictions for the outcomes already. I'm getting word that we are already on upset alert between the matchup of LCR and the campaign for North Africa. North Africa has become vehemently popular in the last couple of years, and a lot of those fans are going to want to see the game do well. LCR is going to have an extremely tough first round matchup there. In addition to that, we're seeing a very lopsided prediction in terms of the public assistance versus Bear Valley option. Bear Valley is not that well known among the general gaming circle, so it going up against a titan of controversy like public assistance in the first round is going to be an extremely tough match for it to overcome. Other than that, we should have a very good first round on our hands for the Stink region. But don't leave just yet, 48 more games have yet to be revealed for the tournament, and titles from across the world are still waiting in anticipation to hear their name called for the tournament. So let's move over to the other side of the bracket and take a look at those teams playing in the Stank region. To start the region off, we have the number one seed, One Upmanship. Mine's Bigger. This 2013 title pits players against one another in a bid to be the first one to earn $100,000 through property acquisition, stock trading, and other money-making ventures. The game is universally panned due to being poorly designed from both a gameplay and visual perspective, being incredibly tough to keep track of all the moving parts, and having one of the worst board game mechanics of all time, the Loser's Reset. But every game will have its own fan base, and fans of this game enjoy that the game is so unfair that it actually rebalances itself, the stock market mechanic is an interesting new gameplay feature, and it often shakes up the gameplay with some physical challenges. This absolute beast will be going up against the 16 seed of this region, Angry Birds Knock on Wood. This 2011 title sees players build up structures for the pigs to inhabit, only to then take the iconic birds and try to knock down those structures for points. The game's haters say that it relies too heavily on its gimmick and offers little else in terms of gameplay, as well as mentioning that building the towers after each round can become tedious over a long gameplay period. But fans of the game say that it translates the Angry Birds 2D action into the 3D space really well, and is also very fun to use the catapult to try to knock down the towers. Our next matchup will see the introduction of the number 8 seed, 
Oy vey! This 1979 title sees players roleplay as a Jewish mother as you attempt to get both of your sons to become doctors and both of your daughters to be married to doctors. The game has seen its fair share of haters due in part to the absolutely wildness of that theme as well as the board design being an absolute mess to look at. But fans of the title love that it requires strategic movement when moving your pieces and also rewards creative thinking and adapting to new situations as they happen. Oy vey will be going up against the number 9 seed, Battle of the Sexes. This 1997 title divides players up into teams of men and women, and forces players to try to move up the board by answering questions that would be more well known by the opposite sex. Enemies of the title point out that the multiple pawns make the title drag on for way too long, the wild cards feature some absolutely broken ones that can end the game immediately, and that the theme of the game overall is not exactly the best idea. But the game's fans love the interesting twist on the standard trivia format, and that the difficulty of the questions for each team are offset by having the opposing team pick the questions that they need to answer. Moving on to our next battle, we have the number 5 seed of the Rock Paper Scissors game. This 2005 release tries to put a new spin on the classic Rock Paper Scissors formula by adding a 3D element to the mix, and by also allowing multiple people to play at a time. Those that are not fans of the game would like to point out that this title does nothing to add to the Rock Paper Scissors formula. In fact, the only thing that it does add to the classic game is a price tag that you need to pay. Fans of the game, however, do enjoy the included 3D console as well as the fact that it opens up the classic Rock, Paper, Scissors game to anyone that does not have fingers. It will be facing off against our number 12 seed, Pass Out. This drinking game from 1962 sees players try to move around the board and collect tokens by reciting tongue twisters, but with each wrong pronunciation of the twister, a drink is required. Detractors of the title were quick to point out that there is actually no penalty for screwing up the tongue twisters, as other than the drinking that you are intending to do by playing the game, screwing up the tongue twister too many times will end up with you gaining the token anyway, removing the one skill-based portion of the game that was included. They are also quick to point out that based on how long the game is, if you are playing with the wrong people, this game is extremely dangerous to your health. But fans of the game say that it accomplishes what it sets out to do very well, and that the simple gameplay loop requires little investment from the party setting. Up next in the bracket, we have the number 4 seed, Shoots and Ladders. This absolutely classic title sees kids try to make it all the way up to the top of the board at square 100 by spinning the spinner, along the way encountering ladders that can take them higher, or shoots that will move them backwards. This game's haters like to point out that there is nothing for anyone to do except for spin the spinner and then see what happens. And also, we'll mention that a particularly unlucky group could end up playing this game for absolute ages. But due to the game's widespread success, this game also has a ton of fans that like to point out that it is easy to play for all ages, and that the unpredictable nature of the game means that anyone could take or lose the advantage at any time, creating massive amounts of tension. Let's check in on the Classic Game Watch Party to see how they feel about shoots and ladders making it in. And they are positively thrilled. We love to see that kind of energy here at the NBGA. Moving on, Shoots and Ladders will be going up against the number 13 seed, Killer Bunnies. Killer Bunnies in the Quest for the Magic Carrot is a 2002 card game that sees players attempting to acquire as many carrots as possible in the hopes that when the game is over, one of theirs will be the titular Magic Carrot that awards them the win. The game's haters have many complaints about the title, saying that any careful planning is useless due to the random win condition, that the game is tedious and basic without purchasing the expansions, and that the base game can slow to a crawl or stop completely due to the low bunny count in Killer Bunnies. But the game's fans say otherwise, saying that there's a deep strategy to playing your cards and interacting with the other players, the game moves very quickly as players get more familiar with the cards, and the social aspect forces you to work with other players while at the same time trying to beat them. With the top half filled out, let's move to the bottom half of the Stank region and meet the number 2 seed, Global Survival. This Monopoly-style title sees players move around the board and investing in countries from around the world, 
while attempting to bankrupt their opponents and become the last man standing. This game has seen widespread panning across the board due to how absurdly overcomplicated it is, the length of the game being completely inconceivable with the possibility of taking multiple hours for one board rotation, and for the fact that the game's economy is completely broken right at the very beginning. But fans of the game love how it fits into the extreme board game niche, coming loaded with geographical and country information from the time period and featuring every single country from 1992 as a space on the board. Global Survival will be facing off against the number 15 seed, Bean Boozled. This 2007 smash hit sees players compete in a last man standing event, where they spin the spinner to learn what bean they must ingest and then eat it to see whether they get a good flavor or a bad flavor, being eliminated when they refuse to eat a bean or have to spit it out. Some of the haters will point to the nastiness of the beans as a negative, but some will focus more on the mechanics, seeing that if players are too prideful to give up, then the game will drag on forever, as well as the game coming with a finite amount of beans which will force you to buy more when they run out. However, fans of the game are numerous, seeing that the reactions to the bean's bad flavors are very funny, and the roulette-style gameplay keeps the stakes high throughout the game. Our next game in is the number 7 seed, Top Trumps. This title, first introduced in 1968, comes with cards that feature numerical values for different attributes. Players make their way through the game by drawing a card, calling out one of the numbers, and then seeing which of the card's numbers is the highest of that attribute. The winner will then collect all the cards, and the next round will begin. Critics of the game point to its similarities to War, being that there are no gameplay elements other than calling out a category and seeing whose number is higher on the card you draw. This repetitive gameplay can turn dull fast and even suffer from War Game Stall Syndrome if cards keep getting traded with no real advantage being given away. But fans of the title mention that it rewards an understanding of the deck and category types and can be used as a great game for teaching kids differences in numerical values. It will be competing for its spot against the number 10 seed, Capital Punishment. This 1981 pro death penalty game forces players to try and get their criminals into death row the fastest, all while utilizing their own liberal pieces to try and get other players' criminals back out free on the streets. The game was hugely controversial on release due to its demonizing and oversimplification of the justice system, all while featuring some genuinely not-so-great elements within the cards and the board. However, fans of the game point out that this game is actually really fun to play, and reward strategic movement of your pieces and making tough choices in a risk-reward type scenario. Our next competitor to be revealed is the number 3 seed, Super Deck. This 1994 collectible card game sees players select a hero and a villain to fight against another player's hero and villain card, all while trying to strengthen their characters with the supplemental cards that they can equip to their champions. While the game sounds complex, haters of the title will be quick to point out that the game actually features no complex mechanics at all, as the card's only function will be either to make your character's numbers bigger or make your opponent's numbers smaller. And since there are no complex mechanics to the game, it practically plays itself based on who has the better luck when drawing their opening cards. Fans of the title love the game for its great artwork and theming being able to immerse you in a superhero world, as well as the fact of it being a collectible card game allowing you to customize your deck with your own favorite cards. Super Deck will be competing in the opening round against the number 14 seed, Gay Monopoly. This fan favorite title from 1983 saw players move around the Monopoly-inspired board of gay districts from around the United States, while trying to bankrupt their opponents and engaging in some of the unique mechanics added by the title, before it was ultimately sued out of existence by Parker Brothers, the makers of Real Monopoly. Detractors of the title will be quick to point out that it claims to support the gay lifestyle while also being neck deep in gay stereotypes as well as pointing out that the Ollie's Hanky Code questions are practically impossible to answer correctly if you haven't played the game before. 
However, the fans of the title love that it is both well-designed both artistically and mechanically, and that it shakes up the classic Monopoly formula with trivia and challenge elements that successfully lessen the Monopoly endgame syndrome. Up next in our bracket, we have the number 6 seed of 1,000 places to see before you die. This 2006 title sees players compete to be the first one to have a fun trip around the world while stopping at popular tourist destinations along the way to learn about areas in that location. Those not fans of the title point to the dull gameplay as one of its biggest negatives, as all you do is roll dice and try to move around the board quickly, and that the game can even stall if a location comes to the top of the deck that nobody wants and nobody draws it. However, the title's fans love the game's great photography and the simple gameplay that makes it easy to play and understand, and also the fact that it could be used to teach geography to younger players. It will be going up against the number 11 seed, the Vanilla Ice Electronic Rap Game. This 1991 Vanilla Ice tie-in sees players attempt to complete rap lines on the game board, before rapping those sick beats right out to your friends with the help of the electronic beatbox mic included with the game. Enemies of the Vanilla Ice electronic rap game would like to point out that the Mad Lip style raps are absolutely complete nonsense, and that the game has little replayability since most of the raps are about close to being the same. But those that love the title will point out that the absurdity of the concept makes spitting out these raps hilarious for all the other players, and that the game is pretty easy to set up and has a low amount of commitment for how much fun it provides the group. And with that, we've seen every game that will be competing in the Stank region. Let's take a look at the matchups and see which ones stick out. In the top half of this region, it seems pretty evenly matched, but we will be definitely keeping an eye out for whichever one of the 8 or 9 seed that moves on going up against 1-Upmanship. That should be an absolutely phenomenal matchup. But when looking at the bottom half of this region, we are seeing a ton of upset potential. A large amount of highly ranked heavy hitters are going to be taking the stage here. Capital Punishment, Gay Monopoly, and the Vanilla Ice Electronic Rap Game all have a really good chance of taking the second round spot from these single seated teams. So you're going to want to keep your eye out on this division when filling out your brackets. With the Stank region complete, we've now determined half of the games that will be competing in the tournament. But dozens of games are still glued to their screams in the hope that their name will be called out and give them a shot at greatness. Will these games have their hopes crushed and their chance to make it in dashed? Now let's head down to the Stunk region to see who has made it in down there. Our first competitor from this region will be the number one seed, WWB. The 2011 title, World's Worst Board Game, sees players attempt to go from the start to the finish, passing through 100 cards along the way in a 1v1 match. Players do this by rolling one die, and if they manage to roll a five, they can move ahead one space, but then must roll another five immediately after, or they will be returned to the starting space. This loop continues until one player has reached the finish. Enemies of this title are quick to point out that this is hardly even a game, more so accurately a rolling the dice simulator until one player gets lucky with unimaginable odds and manages to win. In fact, an actual computer simulation determined that it would likely take more than 28 billion turns to just reach space number 13, and then immediately after, the simulation crashed. But fans of the game love it for having set out to be awful and passed with flying colors, and also being a great way to torture exactly one friend for all eternity. WWB will be going up against the number 16 seed, Quelf. Quelf is a 2005 title that sees players move around the board while drawing cards that force them to do random and incredibly silly things the entire time. The game's haters will focus on the random elements and the penalties making the game difficult to finish. And also, if the game's humor does not land, then it doesn't really have anything else to offer. But fans of the game see it as an extremely fun party game that forces your friends into hilarious scenarios, with there being such a large variety of their scenarios that it always keeps the gameplay fresh. Next up in the Stunk region, we have the number 8 seed, The Game of Life. The classic wheel-spinning title sees players attempt to go around their life while collecting the most amount of money as possible hoping to have the highest total when their life is over. This game has garnered a ton of hate in the last few years, based on the fact that it offers hardly any gameplay other than spinning the wheel, and because of the salary system, the game can be decided in the first couple of turns, or, if playing with the Millionaire Tycoon option, 
at the very end completely at random. But with a game this popular, it is bound to have a ton of fans, who love the game's ease of setup and low commitment, making it an excellent party game, as well as, based on the version you're playing, having a couple of different key decisions that could give you an edge over your opponents. Let's see how the Game of Life is feeling about his spot in the tournament. Looks like he's celebrating already. I can't wait to see what he has in store for us once the tournament starts. Life will be going up against the number nine seed, What Do You Mean? This 2016 title forces players to compete to see who can make the funniest meme, earning points if their internet funny haha -ha pictures can outperform their opponents. The biggest complaint about this title is that it is just genuinely unfunny, and that it's a less polished version of Cards Against Humanity with a lot less variety in what your answers can actually be. But fans of the game see it as a harmless comedy game that can be played by those out of touch with the internet. It even features a little bit of strategy to the cards you play as you attempt to key in on the judge sense of humor. Up next, we meet the number five seed of this region, Fat Chance. This 1978 title sees players attempt to move their fat man pawns around the board while collecting as few pounds as possible. Players can then compete in weigh-ins against their opponents to see who has gained the fewest amount of weight and earn points based on the difference. The opposition to Fat Chance will point out that the pellets are distributed way too slowly to keep the game moving as well as weighing too little to actually make a change on the scale, making it practically useless. But the game's fans love the new mechanics that are unique to the title, and how the game rewards a good memory by keeping an eye on how many pounds your opponents have gained to know who to challenge. It will be going up against the number 12 seed, Speak Out. This 2016 smash hit forces players to attempt to pronounce different phrases while wearing a mouthpiece that does not allow them to shut their mouth correctly. Points are awarded to players when they are able to correctly guess what their teammate is trying to say. Those against this title will say that the game physically hurts to play and is pretty nasty to watch, while also featuring a gimmick that wears thin quickly and with mouth guards that need to be cleaned multiple times if playing in larger groups. However, fans of the title mention that it is genuinely funny to watch your friends struggle to pronounce these phrases, and that the small playtime and low commitment can help prevent the gimmick from getting stale. Our next competitor is the number four seed, Phase 10. This 1982 card game sees players try to compete to become the first to finish all 10 phases, with each phase requiring a different group of cards to collect in order to win that round. Those against the game mention how unjustifiably long it takes to play for how simple the gameplay is, as well as the scoring system being completely redundant due to the game being extremely prone to runaways. But fans of the game love how easy it is to pick up and play, with simple to learn rules that make it perfect for a low commitment large gathering. It will be going up against the number 13 seed of the Pumpkin King. This 2005 Halloween-themed title sees players race through the cemetery and attempt to become the titular Pumpkin King, while avoiding the cat that will send them back to the start if it catches them. Enemies of this title mention that the only actions that you can take in the game are rolling your dice and moving your pieces, with the I space on the dice being too prevalent so that you will be getting sent back to the start constantly by other players, making the game drag if one player isn't lucky enough to get through the resets. But fans of the game are adamant about how beautiful the custom molded pieces are, how easy the game is to play with its simple rules, and how the board being entirely customizable makes no two playthroughs the same. Now let's move down to the bottom half of the Stunk region and meet our number two seed, the Ungame. Released in 1973, the Ungame attempts to make its players better at communicating more effectively by allowing them to share thoughts, ideas, and feelings and making people tell it like it is. The game prides itself on featuring no competition, allowing everyone to be a winner so long as they learn a little bit about themselves in the process. Some people absolutely despise this title, seeing that it is more therapy than an actual game, featuring pretty much nothing to do other than answer a question and then move on to the next turn, and that it can produce awkward situations by forcing conversations from the cards. But fans of the game would be quick to point out that it really isn't even a game. It helps people to learn communicate better, and answers can be at the level that the person is most comfortable with, preventing that awkwardness. It will be going up against the number 15 seed, 
Mall Madness. This 1988 title, made to be played pretty much anywhere, features the gameplay loop of trying to spend all of your $200 by shopping at various locations around the mall. Players can move around the wall using the two spinners, but can also end up gaining money if they're unlucky. Haters of the title see these spinners as a negative, as you have no control over your piece or money and they're all dependent on the spinner. The game can even be a struggle to end because needing to spend exactly $200 can be quite difficult if your spinners don't line up. But fans of the game love that it is simple to play and easy to move, just like it was designed to be, even having a little bit of strategy to it thanks to the inclusion of the arcade and escalator spaces. Our next competitor will be the number 7 seed of Ludi Ludo. Ludi Ludo is an extremely old game where players compete to try to get their four pieces born and into heaven before their opponents are able to do so. The game's detractors point out that rolling dice is really the only thing you do in the game. It involves no specialty spaces or any other type of gameplay element, making it extremely dull if you don't manage to get the game over fast. But those that defend the title mention that there is a small amount of strategy in the order in which you want to move your pieces, and that the title is a great option for young children to try out as one of their first games. It will be going up against the number 10 seed of Pass the Pigs. This 1977 game has you rolling two small pigs around as dice, with you either gaining or losing points based on the positions that the pigs land in. It is a press your luck title that rewards players for going for the higher scores, but also punishes them for being too greedy with their rolls. Those that do not enjoy the game mention that the only action that you have in the game is to roll the pigs, and then decide whether you want to roll the pigs again. In the meantime, there is absolutely nothing for another player to do while one player is busy rolling their pigs. But those that enjoy playing do love the risk-reward mechanic, as it keeps the energy of the game going high for groups and makes the rolls more daunting as the points continue to climb. Moving to our next matchup, we will find the number three seed, Candyland. One of the absolute classic board games, Candyland sees players attempt to adventure through the titular Candy Land and attempt to be the first player to make it to the Candy Castle by drawing cards. The numerous amount of haters of Candy Land will point to the fact that this is not even a game you play, it is just an event that you experience. All you do is draw a card and move your piece to the spot on that card with the game also being completely unbalanced due to the specialty cards that throw you around at random. But the equally as numerous fans of the game see this as a perfect gateway game for young children. The simple rules and gameplay means that literally anybody can play the game, and it could get tense near the end due to the unbalanced nature of those cards. Let's check in again at the Classic Game Watch Party to see how they feel about Candyland making the cut. And they are just as excited as ever. Truly a great group sitting there on that couch. But moving on, Candyland will be competing against the number 14 seed, Trouble. Another classic title, Trouble sees players utilize the Pop-O-Matic technology to move their pieces around the board, while also attempting to impede other players by sending them back to the start. Enemies of the title hate how all you do in the game is tap the dome and see what happens, with the little strategy and luck-reliant gameplay not helping the game in that regard. But fans of the game love how easy the game is to understand and play, and mention that there is more strategy to selecting the piece's movement than there originally seems. And for our last matchup in the Stunk region, we have the number 6 seed, Dose. This 2018 sequel to Uno sees players attempt to get rid of all the cards in their hand by utilizing different mechanics that separates it from the original card game. Although the haters of this title mention that they've managed to take Uno and make it worse. The removal of most of the power cards limits your options of play and not being able to match colors anymore skews the balance of the game to the lower numbers. But those that like Dose love that the rule changes give the game a unique feel to the original and the score-based win condition fixes the issue of the original game possibly running forever. Dose will be matched up against the number 11 seed, Seenit. Seenit sees players compete in a trivia competition that is aided by the DVD element included with the board game. Those that do not enjoy the title point to its low accessibility of needing a DVD player to play, 
the low replayability for a trivia game, and the low strategy of just rolling the dice and answering a question before going to the next turn. But those that like seen it enjoy the DVD implementation as a great way to experiment with the board game formula, and see it as a great game that fills the niche towards movie buffs. Now that the Stunk Region games have been revealed, let's take a look at some of the key matchups that are already projected to impress. We are projecting a clash of titans from the matchup between the Game of Life and What Do You Mean? Both of these titles feature vehement hater bases that are going to do everything in their power to see their game move on, so them meeting in the very first round is going to be a battle to be remembered. Other than that, the Stunk region is pretty balanced in its matchups, while we are predicting a slight possibility of Speak Out coming over Fat Chance due to the amount of popularity that that game has received. This region should be a really good one. But with its completion, we now only have 16 spots left in the tournament, and there are still tons of games everywhere hoping that their name will be called out next. Who will make it in and who will be left at home? It's time to meet the final 16 games that will be competing for a shot at the title in the Stonk region. Heading over there now, let's meet the number one seed of the final region, Adultery. This 1969 title sees players attempt to spend a good time with two different players of the opposite sex by having them spin the spinner to add to their time clock before the second half of the game gets started. Those that do not enjoy the title drag on both of the game's two halves, with the first half of gameplay being just spinning the spinner and gaining tokens, and the second half of the gameplay being actual literal adultery. In addition to that, besides the two players actively playing in the second half, the other players do nothing until it is their turn. Adultery will be going up against the number 16 seed, Anima. This 2006 high fantasy card game sees players attempt to build up their characters while battling beasts with their party members, eventually making their way up to battling an ancient threat at the end of the game. Those against Anima say that the game's randomness can often lead to unbalanced encounters that the party can't overcome, and if not played with the expansions, then the enemy content can run dry by the game's end. But those that enjoy the title love the abundance of character content, and mention that the fantastic combat system makes the game a joy to work through. Up next in the bracket, we find the number 8 seed, Tic-Tac-Toe. This positively ancient game is a 1v1 match where players attempt to either match 3 X's or 3 O's, 3 in a row. Tic-Tac-Toe is the absolute lowest rated game on Board Game Geek, due in part to how extremely basic the game is, how the game's structure leads to most matches ending in a draw, and once the game has been figured out, there's really nowhere to go. But the game is also enjoyed worldwide, seeing that as the ease of rules and play means it can be taught and enjoyed to practically anyone, the low time commitment and ease of setup make it extremely accessible, and with learning the strategies behind the game being very rewarding, especially for children. Tic-Tac-Toe will be going up against the number 9 seed, Macon Bacon. This 2012 title sees players press their luck to try and spell out bacon or roll combinations of the letters to earn points. Haters of this title will point out that it is pretty much just Yahtzee except with even less control over the scoring, and do not enjoy the fact that the only game feature is rolling the dice and deciding whether you want to roll the dice again. However, the game's fans love that the scoring system adds a risk-reward scenario to the rules, and that the quick pace of the game keeps it moving with little downtime. Our next matchup will feature the return of the number 5 seed, Mr. Bacon's Big Adventure. This 2009 title will see players in a mad dash through Meatland, as they compete to be the first one to get to the frying pan while avoiding obstacles like the disgusting Vegan Alley. Those against the title will point out its similarities to Candyland, but with a spinner mechanic that could make the game take even longer. This is in addition to the cards being hopelessly unbalanced, and that the Meat Feast alternative game mode is a genuine health risk to anyone that plays it. But those that enjoy the Meat Madness love how the cards add an element of randomness that keep players invested and that they can also give an element of skill and decision-making to the movements that gives players that think ahead an advantage. Let's check in with Mr. Bacon to see how he feels about making the tournament. Absolutely ecstatic. He's ready to compete for that title, and I think we're all ready to see what Mr. Bacon has in store for us. But to move forward, he will first need to overcome the number 12 seed, 
of Triominoes. This 1965 spin on dominoes sees players compete to get rid of their three-sided tiles, needing to match the numbers on each side in order to place it down. The game's haters point to this just being a more flawed version of dominoes, and that some of the game's design flaws can actually softlock some players into drawing forever, since none of the remaining tiles in the game can match anymore. But the game's fans see it as a more challenging version of dominoes, with the additional bonus system granting players more ways to gain points quickly. In our next battle, we'll meet the number four seed of Miss Monopoly. This 2019 Monopoly spinoff touts itself as the first game where women make more than men, and achieves this through the central mechanic of female players earning more money from Go and starting the game off with more money than any male players. The game's detractors tout the wage gap as one of the worst board game mechanics ever invented. In addition to there being less decision-making factors due to the removal of the house system, and that the game somehow worsens the Monopoly endgame syndrome due to the lower property values. But those in favor of the title love how it simplifies the Monopoly gameplay for younger players, as well as acting as a great way to educate people on female-made inventions. It will be going up against the number 13 seed of Smoker's Wild. This 1978 anti-smoking title sees players try to gain as much money as possible while avoiding becoming addicted to cigarettes. Players will continue to die off from their addiction as the game continues until only one player is left standing. The game's haters will mention that every game will eventually come down to luck, based on either the cards you draw or the die that you roll. And if the game's jokes ever lose their luster, the game can become stale pretty quick. But those that enjoy the title love how the career cards push players to try to get each other addicted to smoking, and that the puns present in the game are absolutely atrocious, which gets a big thumbs up. Moving on to the bottom half of the Stonk region, only eight spots remain for games to make it in, and we'll meet our first one with the number two seed of the region, the Oregon Trail Card Game. This 2016 card game aims to recreate the feel of the classic computer game, seeing your party try to make it all the way to Oregon without dying along the way. Those against the title mention that the game barely even works at all having a ton of ruling holes where parts of the game cannot resolve, and some cards being so poorly worded that players have to make up effects for them in order for the game to continue. In addition to that, the game's balance is completely ruined by the insta-kill cards that cannot be foreseen or prevented in any way, leaving that player with nothing to do other than watch the other players continue the game without them. But those that enjoy the game love its build-as-you-play structure that keeps any two games from being the same. And in addition, despite the card game's many flaws, it still manages to capture the spirit of the original game very well. It will be going up against the number 15 seed, The Mask 3D Board Game. This 1994 tie-in board game sees you attempt to maneuver your Jim Carrey around to find all of his missing belongings that were lost during his time as the mask. Those against the title say that the movement and piece collection is all based on luck unless you have the mask. And if you do manage to get the mask, it is completely broken and will likely end the game in a few turns unless another player is able to take it from you. But the game's fans see it as an extremely well-constructed 3D game that not only looks great, but has fast-paced, intense gameplay since the games are so short. Our next matchup will be featuring the number seven seed of What Shall I Be? The Exciting Game of Career Girls. This 1966 title sees girls attempt to grow up to become one of the six careers that they can look forward to in their future. Those options being a teacher, airline hostess, actress, nurse, model, or ballet dancer. Those against the title will like to key in on the small and extremely shallow list of careers available for the women, and that rolling the dice and seeing if you got the right card is all you do in the game. But the game's fans mention it as a very simple game to play for a young audience, as well as the absurd theming and elements making the game completely unintentionally hilarious. These career girls will be going up against the number 10 seed of the original Trivial Pursuit. This 1981 classic sees players attempt to move around the board and answer trivia questions with their team, collecting pieces of the pie before attempting to land in the middle and answer one final question to become the winner. The detractors of the original version mention that the game is extremely frustrating to play if you cannot get the dice to move the right way to land on the last piece you need as well as every single bit of the center mechanic completely ruining the game's finale. 
But those that enjoy the game love it as a great party option, especially since you can divide into larger groups of teams to share your knowledge, and with the game evening the playing field with a very diverse set of questions. Moving on to our next matchup, we'll meet the number three seed of Deutschlandries. This 1935 German classic sees players attempt to move all throughout the country and visit all of the destinations they were assigned. The first player to reach all of their destinations will win the game. Those against the title say that it can become extremely boring due to only rolling dice the entire time, with the game pretty much always being decided by either whoever rolls the highest numbers faster or who gets the closest together destinations off the opening card draw. But fans of the title see it as a great way to learn about Germany and its geography, with a couple alternate rule sets to add some flavor to the gameplay. Germany will be competing against the number 14 seed, Cheater. This 1995 Rummy-style card game sees players attempt to collect groups of cards while one player is awarded the powers of the Cheater, determined by a dice roll giving them a special advantage over the other players, but one that can also be lost at any time. Those against the title say that the cheater mechanic is completely luck-based as well as the cards you manage to get. With the game being too long for the style of game that it is, and also making some cards completely pointless if you're playing a two-player option. But fans of Cheater love how it rewards memorization and adaptability due to the ever-shifting game state, and that the Cheater is never too broken due to the action cards balancing out his abilities. With that, we've come down to our last two games, and in this matchup we will be seeing the number six seed, Group Therapy. Group Therapy is the 1969 classic that encourages players to work out their problems as they move around the board, doing so by engaging in challenging questions or actions. The game's haters despise that it encourages the everyone's a winner style of play, as well as some of the questions having weird demands or creating awkward moments, and that the fact that the voting-based movement system is ripe for abuse from competitive players but those that enjoy the title see it as a great way to get to know your friends better, and that the game has the option to be taken as seriously as the group wants it to be. Let's see how group therapy feels about its end of the line inclusion. Ooh, and it looks like he is ready to go all in for the event. Group therapy is not one to let this chance go to waste, and will be giving it his all no matter who stands in his way. But before he can do that, he will need to get past the last team included in the tournament, the number 11 seed, Bunko! Bunko sees players attempting to score the most points through six rounds. They do this by rolling the dice and recording their scores based on what they rolled. The game's haters are not fans of the fact that players have no control over the outcome of a game, as all you do is roll your dice and then record the score before moving on to the next player. That combined with the broken scoring system makes the game nothing but luck reliance. But the game's fans love how the game's simple gameplay loop makes it easy to get into as well as that broken scoring system, meaning that anyone can come back from a bad rolling streak at any time. Let's see how Bunko feels about him being the very last game in. And I am seeing a wave of relief. Glad that Bunko can celebrate at this time. A lot of work lies ahead for him, but right now Bunko can celebrate his success. And with that, we now know all 64 games that will be competing in the worst board game of all time tournament. Now that we know who's in, let's take a look at the games that just barely missed the mark with our four near misses. One that I'm sure a lot of people were expecting to make a splash, we have Monopoly. This big name title was left out of the bracket after NBGA officials decided that there are worse official and unofficial versions of Monopoly already present in the bracket. So seeing that it couldn't stack up to its other titles, it was denied a selection spot. A more niche title that was left out was Veilfisk's own torture game. This overcomplex and completely heinous title from the popular game developer did not earn a selection spot due to the game not meeting the qualifications to be eligible, as the game has never been released to the public. An unfortunate disqualification for a game that was sure to make a splash. Another online option that was left out was Insane Monopoly Pyramid Scheme. This title has garnered a lot of attention for being absurdly overcomplicated, but was ultimately denied a selection due to NBGA officials deeming that the game's mechanics all worked perfectly fine, and the fact of it being a digital-only release removes a lot of the frustration of trying to utilize all those mechanics analog. 
And finally, the last near miss, we have Fatal, a widely controversial title featuring some of the most disgusting mechanics ever put to the gaming sphere. It was ultimately determined by the NBGA officials that it is technically not a board game, as it is much closer in mechanics and gameplay to pen and paper RPGs like Dungeons and Dragons, a tragic disqualification for a game that was certain to have a deep run into the tournament. Let's check in on some of the other hopefuls that were just a little too good to make it in as well. And the jubilee that was felt at the Classic Games watch party has turned to sadness as Connect 4 has failed to qualify for the tournament. It will have to be content of watching its friends compete from home, as unfortunately it will not be able to compete alongside them. And here we're also seeing Money Card, the American Express travel game contemplating where it all went wrong. I can assure you that that is not a celebratory Angry Orchard. And here we're also seeing the tragedy of Secret Hitler. It has to be absolutely crushed, as it is one of the few fan-nominated games that didn't make it into the final bracket. All of these titles and many more will have to sit and watch from home to see which of the games will be able to accomplish what they were unable to. And with that, it's time to let the games rest and get ready for the big event. Signing off for the National Board Game Association, I am Cam Sandwich. Thank you for watching, and have a fantastic day. How's it going dudes? Welcome back to the worst board game of all time community tournament. The opening round has finally reached its conclusion, seeing 32 of the worst board games from around the world eliminated from contention, while the remaining games all get one step closer to the championship. But which games are moving on and which games are being left behind? That's what we're here to find out, with the official declaration of the first round results. This time I'll be joined virtually by my color commentator, Joshua Jacobs. Pleasure to be here, Cam. Sorry I can't join you in person. That's okay, Josh. How's it going with the super rabies? Apparently it's an affront to modern science. Well, that's great, Josh. You're setting records. Now let's move over to the big bracket and see which games we'll be moving on. Let's start off by meeting our winners from the Stink region. Our first matchup will see a clash between our first two winners, War versus the NBC TV News Game. Both games took a clear victory over their opponents and are looking strong going into the next round. They each have some high criticism behind them, and we are expecting some fierce competition from NBC. But War is a number one seed for a reason, so keep your eyes on this one. Next up, we have a very surprising matchup of the Campaign for North Africa, The Desert War, 1940-43, versus Doggy Doo. Cam, we had North Africa on Upset Watch, but hardly anyone expected Doggy Doo to pull this one out. We had some predictions of Pug U going all the way, so seeing it lose round one like this is a devastating blow for that title. But look into the future, I don't know what Doggy Doo is capable of, and if it can knock off the Titan of North Africa, we might be seeing a deep run here. That's not going to be easy though, all I can guarantee from this one is that it will be a shame to see one of these stories end here. Well said Joshua, let's move on to the bottom part of the region and meet our next matchup of the worst case scenario survival game versus public assistance. WCS managed a good win over Sorry to move on. Meanwhile, Public Assistance absolutely smashed Bear Valley with the largest margin of victory in the region. Cam, I don't see Public Assistance stopping here. You don't have that big of an opener and then just fall immediately after. WCS had a great win, but I'm predicting their tournament ends here. Public Assistance is poised for a deep run. Well, regardless of who moves on, they will be going up against the winner of our next match, Time Control versus 15 Love. Both games face tough competition, with 15 Love pulling a surprising upset over Power Lunch, and Time Control almost falling against the number 15 seed Mad Magazine game. We're still marking Time Control as the favorite to advance, but keeping an eye on 15 Love might not be a bad idea since it's defied the odds before. With that, we have the complete second round for the region. Joshua, which games are you keeping an eye on to make a splash? I'm looking at 15 Love here. After that open, a Time Patrol is looking extremely vulnerable, and if 15 Love has what it takes to pull one upset, another one won't be that hard to serve up. And again, I am excited to see if Doggy Doo can do it again. Two potential Cinderella's are matched up here, and I want to know whose story is ending and whose is just beginning. Absolutely, Josh, but before we can see that, we need to learn who else will be competing in the next round. So let's go to the Stank region and meet their second rounders. Up first, we've got One Upsmanship 
versus Oi Vey. These two titles have advanced on convincing wins to get up against each other now. Both ride partially on their themes, one-upsmanship on how broken it is, and oy vey on the controversy. So we're predicting a brutal battle between games that could go far on a victory. Next up, we have our next match of the Rock, Paper, Scissors game versus Shoots and Ladders. These two children's titles lived up to their seating and advanced convincingly, and now face each other with a trip to the next round on the line. If I'm being honest here, Cam, I can see an upset brewing here. Shoots and Ladders has a lot of haters, but I'd rather spin that spinner a hundred times before I pay to play Rock, Paper, Scissors, and I think a lot of people are going to agree with me. By no means an easy match, but I think RPS has a real shot here. A big prediction from Josh there as we move down to the bottom half of the region and meet our next matchup, the Vanilla Ice Electronic Rap Game versus Super Deck. Vanilla Ice managed to put a convincing win together, meanwhile Super Deck was barely able to beat off Gay Monopoly. I don't think this one is as easy as it seems. Sure, Super Deck almost allowing a come from behind from Gay Monopoly looks bad, but that is a tough first round matchup that it managed to overcome. Meanwhile, the consensus on Vanilla Ice is split heavily on how enjoyable it can be. A lot are seeing an easy upset opportunity here. I think this will be a lot closer than it seems. That brings us into the last matchup of the Stank region, Capital Punishment versus Bean Boozle. A shocking upset in round one sees our number 15 seed moving on from the opening round on a buzzer beater finish. A Cinderella story in the making for sure, but it will have to make it past Capital Punishment if it wants to keep its dream alive. This will be no easy matchup as Capital Punishment easily took out Top Trumps, so Bean Boozled will have to shock again if it wants to make it past this beast of controversy. Now that we have all the Stank Region winners, let's send it over to Joshua to see which matchups we should keep an eye on. Bean Boozled, that was an absolutely wild finish, came all the way down to the wire, and now we've already lost one of our top seeds. But I think Bean Boozled might have just stumbled into an even tougher matchup here. Capital Punishment's solid mechanics did not stop it from using its controversy to trounce Top Trumps in the opener, and it's not going to show any mercy to the underdog here. I'd say Capital Punishment has the best chance of taking this one, but Bean Boozled has already shocked us once, who's to say it won't do it again? Also, just like you mentioned in the selection show, we'll want to be watching that number 1 versus number 8 matchup. One-upmanship has a lot going for it, but Oive has already shown that it is not messing around here. I don't know if we're officially on upset watch here, but I think it'll be a great match nonetheless. With those games, we've now covered half the pool, but we've still got 16 more winners to declare. It's time to hit the bottom half of the bracket, starting off with the Stunk region. Our first matchup of winners will see WWB taking on What Do You Mean? Both games secured convincing victories, with What Do You Mean absolutely decimating the game of life. That was a shocking outcome. The Game of Life had a lot of hype behind it going into the tournament, so seeing it get utterly dismantled like this by the meme machine, I'm starting to think we've got a dark horse on our hands. If I was WWB, I'd go into this match expecting a slog, because this is not going to be an easy win for the title. Too true, alongside them we'll see our next matchup of Speak Out versus Phase 10. These two beat out their competition by similar amounts, but the difference lies in Speak Out pulling off a major upset to get here. This will be an interesting matchup to be sure, as both games are seeing support and disdain for their advancement. Any prediction that I would make here would just be pure speculation, so I won't even try and instead leave it up to the votes and move on. Let's travel to the bottom half of the region to meet our next match, where Dose will be competing against Candyland. Both games secured very convincing wins, with Candyland having the largest margin of victory in the whole region. I think this one is clear. Candyland came out with a vengeance and is running red hot right now. Dose had a convincing victory, sure, but it will be facing an entirely different beast this time. Dose is going to need perfect play, luck, and a small miracle if it wants to make it out of this round still intact. This will carry us into our final match here of Ludi Ludo going up against the Ungame. The Ungame managed to overcome Maul Madness with little struggle, but Ludi Ludo did have some trouble with Pass the Pigs. We'll be looking to see if Ludo can get the gears turning to give itself a chance in this upcoming match, while our number two seed will be hoping for a repeat performance and an easy trip to the next round. With our third region finished, let's hear what Joshua has to say about the matchups. Cam, this is an extremely top-heavy region. We have a phenomenal matchup at the start with WWB taking on What Do You Mean? This is probably one of the best matchups in the entire round, and it'll be very entertaining to see who can claim the win here. 
but looking at the rest of the region, it's either a clear-cut winner or a completely unpredictable match. There's some potential with the Candyland Dose matchup, but otherwise, we're just gonna have to watch and see what happens. And with Josh rounding out the Stunk region, we are ready to see the games competing in the second round of the Stonk region. So let's head there now to meet our first match, where Adultery will be facing off against Macon Bacon. Okay, I want you to compare the outcome of the 8 and 9 match versus the 1 and 16 and tell me that Adultery is not going to steamroll this one. This was the highest margin of victory in the tournament. Adultery was the only one to even hit the 90s this entire round. I'm not trying to say Macon Bacon doesn't have a shot. It got a great round one win, but Adultery is not going home here. Bold predictions from Josh there as we look to the next match of this region, Mr. Bacon's Big Adventure versus Miss Monopoly. These two titles both trounced their competition with convincing wins, but now face each other with elimination on the line. Miss Monopoly's backwards theming carried it through the first round, but will it be enough to overcome Mr. Bacon's X Factor of being able to cause real world death? Only time will tell as we move to the bottom of the region to meet our next battle of group therapy against Deutschlandreise. These two titles advanced with pretty decent wins and now look to keep the streak going and avoid elimination. I think I'll be putting this one on upset watch cam. We still don't know Deutschland Rise's full potential, but we do know that group therapy is going to give 100% effort the entire time. If the Germans want to stay in the bracket, they'll need to be ready for some real pushback here. That is true, group therapy well known for never copping out. Finally, let's look at our last match of the second round where What Shall I Be, the exciting game of career girls, will take on the Oregon Trail card game. We've got a lot of upset potential here too. The Oregon Trail has been famous for barely functioning, but we've seen a bunch of support of the title claiming that it's still fun to play. The trail is going to need to overcome these claims if it wants to get past these career girls who came out swinging in the first round with a decisive win over Trivial Pursuit. We could see a very interesting outcome from this one for sure. And those are all the competitors moving on from the Stonk region. Let's see which matchups we need to keep an eye on. Josh? Up top, give me Mr. Bacon versus Miss Monopoly. This battle of the sexes is going to be a killer matchup for sure. Both games have such unique negatives going for them, and seeing them clash here is certainly going to be an entertaining sight. Regardless of who wins though, they're going to have a rough next round if Adultery pulls through. Add that with the fact that the whole bottom half is on upset watch, and we've got some stellar competition throughout the whole region. And that will wrap up our competitors for the second round. Before we wrap up, Josh will take us through the most surprising early round exits. Josh? Yeah, Cam, we have had some shockers already. One that people are still reeling from is the upset of number four, Pug U. This is the favorite of many to make a deep run, but underestimating Doggy Doo proved fatal for the title. You have to show up ready to play no matter who the opponent is. Now, Pug U is going to be watching the rest of the tournament from home. A loss even us watching couldn't believe was that of number two Global Survival. It was tied for most of its match, managed to get a lead towards the end, and then gave up a game-winning buzzer beater to allow Bean Boozled to steal the win. This is why you don't mess around in these situations. When you have your foot on the tiger's neck, you don't let up because it will spin around and maul you right there. Global Survival failed to finish off Bean Boozled while it had the chance. Bean Boozled took advantage of the opportunity. Now Global Survival is heading home and will be running this loss back in its head for a long time. Another shocking early loss is coming to us from the Game of Life. Look, I know that it had a brutal first round opponent with the Meme Machine, but with the amount of hate this game has been receiving online recently, I figured it would have at least had a fighting chance. Instead, it got creamed. I'm honestly more surprised at the margin of the loss than the fact that it lost at all. This was a lot of people's dark horse going for a deep run, so it's pretty surprising that it not only got eliminated here, but thoroughly embarrassed in the opener. A tough scene for those games, but looking forward we still have 32 competitors looking to take a shot at the title. Each of these games already has a win under their belt, and we'll be looking to add to that to prove they have what it takes to go all the way. Let us know below if your bracket is already busted, and which match outcomes had you celebrating or fuming. Get ready for the second round as we get one step closer to finding out who is the worst board game of all time. Signing off for the NBGA, I am Cam Sandwich. Thank you for watching and have a fantastic day. How's it going, dudes?
Welcome back to the worst board game of all time, Community Tournament. We've just finished up the second round, so now it's time to see which 16 games have survived and advanced, and which 16 will be headed home in shame. A reminder that we're not just playing for pride here, as over 600 brackets were submitted to try to predict the results of the tournament, with the first place winner taking home this 1973 vintage version of Pit. After the opening round, we had zero perfect brackets remaining, most likely the work of these guys. But what we did have was one lone person standing tall above the rest of the field, with Bai and the Bunny holding the lead with 280 points. But will they be able to hold on to their lead? That's what we're here to find out with the official declaration of the second round results. I'm joined virtually once again by my color commentator, Joshua Jacobs. Pleasure to be back, Cam. I'm ready to jump right into it. Well, if you're ready, then so am I. Let's head over to the big bracket and take a look at the teams that will be making it to the next round. We'll start off in the Stink region, where we find our first matchup of the third round, War, going up against the Campaign for North Africa, The Desert War, 1940-43. These two classic war games each faced fierce competition in the second round, but managed to fight their way through and make it to the terrible third. War, being the number one seed in the region, should inspire some confidence in its ability to perform, and has for some with 14 different people predicting it to be the champion of the tournament. However, based on the numbers, it is actually the campaign for North Africa that has inspired the most faith from the people, with 89 different brackets predicting North Africa to be the last game standing. This difference is completely unprecedented, and is leading us to believe that the number 12 seed might actually be favored to beat the number 1. Those numbers are completely unbelievable. The fact that this 12 seed has rallied almost a sixth of the total bracket pool behind it is insane. Honestly, if I was War, I'd be offended that this little of the crowd believed I have what it takes. War needs to use this as motivation for the match, as it is about to face an absolute monster in this third round. We did see North Africa struggle a little bit against Doggy Doo, so it's not invincible. But just because it's possible to beat something, doesn't mean you'll actually be able to pull it off. Our other match from this region will see Public Assistance taking on 15 Love. A massive upset from our bottom match sees our second double-digit seed from this region moving on. 15 Love, a true surprise from the success it's found, with only three brackets in total predicting the tennis title to go all the way. It will have to overcome the odds again to continue though, as it will be facing one of the most consistent games in the tournament in public assistance. PA has cruised through its first two matchups with little struggle, posting massive margins of victory on its way to the third round. It will be looking to continue its dominant streak in order to get a shot at the quarterfinals and continue the hopes of the 32 brackets that had it winning it all. In my opinion, 15 Love is the true Cinderella of this region. We all had our eyes on North Africa from the start, but very few were expecting 15 Love to make it this far, so it's a true surprise. Does it have a chance? Eh, no. Public assistance hasn't scored less than 80 at any point during this tournament, and there is nothing to show that they're about to slow down here. I'm predicting another blowout, but at the same time, 15 Love was predicted to lose in both of its last two matches. If it managed to overcome the odds twice before, who am I to say that it can't do it again? Those are the four teams advancing from this region. Let's give it over to Josh to learn which games he wants to see move on from here. I'll give you a quarterfinal matchup that would be sure to impress. I want to see the campaign for North Africa go up against public assistance. Both games you've covered before, Cam, so you should know just how tough of a choice this would be for the voters. Both fan favorite titles, both seeing immense support behind them, both carrying wildly different reasons for making it this far, this would be an all-time classic matchup that I would not want to miss out on. At the same time, everyone loves a good Cinderella battle, and if 15 Love can overcome this opponent, there really is nothing it can't do. Some great matchups ahead of us, but before we get there, we need to see the other 12 games that will be competing in this round. We'll continue to meet our round two winners by heading now over to the Stank region. Our first match here will see a clash between Oi Vey and the Rock Paper Scissors game. Each of these games is coming off an upset, with RPS smashing through shoots and ladders and Oi Vey knocking out our first number one seed of the tournament with one-upmanship. 
This leaves us with a stellar matchup between two games carrying a lot on their backs, as Oive was chosen to win in 10 different brackets, while RPS is representing 43 players as their champion. A really good matchup here, Cam. RPS's uselessness gives it an edge that not a lot of games can take advantage of. But whether that can make it past a game with such bad theming that it overcomes one-upmanship? We'll have to wait and see. Both of these titles have a great chance of making it out of here, but at the end of the day, it's just gonna come down to who wants it more. Let's head now to our other match from the region, where the Vanilla Ice electronic rap game will be enduring capital punishment. These two double-digit seeds won by similar margins, with the difference being Vanilla Ice pulling off a major upset for the opportunity to advance. Both games are trying to keep their Cinderella stories alive for the people who believed in them, with 12 people predicting Capital Punishment to win it all, and 7 instead choosing the Iceman as their champion. First off, I want to give a shout out to Bean Boozled. It pulled off an incredible win in the first round and really put up a good fight here in the second. But for our two games here, I don't know. Every ounce of my being says there's no way Capital Punishment stops here. It's coming off two great wins and has a lot on its side. At the same time, it's the Vanilla Ice electronic rap game. This thing is a total anomaly. I find myself being confused as to how it's still even here, and at the same time, I can reasonably imagine it somehow being the one to make it out of the region. This thing is a complete and total wild card, and if you let up for even a second against the thriller of vanilla, you might just end up heading home. A great lineup of games for the Stank region. Josh, who are you hoping to see make it out of this round? If I'm being honest, I want to see a battle between Rock, Paper, Scissors and Vanilla Ice. A completely pointless version of a classic versus a horrifying rap tie-in from the 90s. Oh man, that is an absolute dream! But at the same time, a controversy battle between Capital Punishment and Oi Vey would make for some pretty entertaining stuff. We really can't go wrong with this region. No matter who moves on, there's sure to be a great match waiting for us after. And with that, we've covered half the teams that will be moving on to the third round. But we've still got eight more games that will be gunning for that championship title. It's time to look at the remaining eight games that will be advancing to the third round, starting with the Stunk region. Our first matchup here will see What Do You Meme taking on Speak Out. Another bevy of upsets sees not only another number 12 seed advancing, but our second number 1 seed elimination with WWB. Both of these titles seemed relatively unassuming heading into the tournament, but have proven through big wins that they deserve to be feared. Both games have a decent following supporting them, with Speak Out being the champion in 15 brackets and What Do You Mean being chosen in 36 different ones. I'm predicting at least 15 angry people after this match. Speak Out has fought and clawed its way up to this point. Meanwhile, the meme machine has been busy grinding other games into dust. None of its matchups have been close, and those weren't nobodies either. That was a number one seed and the game of life. Those are tough matchups against any other opponent, and what do you mean destroyed them? I want to root for Speak Out here. Everybody loves an underdog, but this match better have police on the scene because there's going to be another murder. Our other match from this region will see a battle between Candyland and the Ungame. One of our few sections with no upsets, both high seeds took their wins handily and now face each other in the third round like they are supposed to. However, support for the titles is lopsided the other way, with 23 brackets predicting Candyland to win it all while only 9 had the Ungame doing the same. This is a good one. Both of these games have put together good runs, but I've seen some discourse on whether the Ungame deserves to move on or not. Candyland is obviously a tough opponent, but it struggled a little more in the last round than I expected it to. Keep an eye on this one for sure, because it could be anyone's game. With the Stunk region revealed, Josh will run us through the matchup he would like to see in the future. I am loving the opportunity to see What Do You Meme go up against Candyland next round. A consistent theme from these games and their matchups has been a ton of hate for the fact that they even exist. If these two heavy hitters clash, emotions are going to run hot during that battle, and that is going to result in some very entertaining discourse for sure. You aren't gonna want to miss this. And that leaves only one region remaining to be covered. It's time to meet the remaining four games making the third round as we go over to the Stonk region. Our first battle here will feature the matchup of Adultery versus Miss Monopoly. 
These two games each plowed through their competition, with Miss Monopoly taking a convincing win over a tough opponent in Mr. Bacon, and Adultery atomizing its second opponent in a row with Macon Bacon. Both titles have a lot of people's hopes riding on them, as 35 people picked Miss Monopoly as their champion, and 61 people predicted Adultery to take home the crown. An all-time classic here. You could tell me that this was the championship match right now and I would believe you. Some absolutely killer negatives are carrying both these titles, but honestly, this could be a lopsided finish. Not a single game has come within 75 points of adultery so far, and that's for a good reason. However, people have started talking, and there are rumors swirling that it's only putting up these big points because it's gone up against some Mickey Mouse matchups. So this is going to be the first real trial that adultery will have to overcome. Does Miss Monopoly have what it takes to knock off a number one seed? We're just gonna have to wait and see. The winner of that match will be facing the victor of our final matchup, Group Therapy versus What Shall I Be? The exciting game of career girls. Each of these games moved on to the third round convincingly, finding little trouble in taking their second tournament wins. We have some real sleeper teams here, as not many brackets had these teams as their champ. With 11 selections for What Shall I Be, and only three total people believing in group therapy. I know it's tempting to think What Shall I Be will walk away with an easy win here, but group therapy made it here for a reason. Underestimating your opponents has cost several games their spots in the tournament, and if What Shall I Be does the same here just because of the low support numbers, it might end up being group therapy's next victim. These career girls have put a strong campaign together. They are looking really bad out there. Keep doing what you're doing, and the spot in the quarterfinals could be yours. With the remaining games now revealed, let's look at who Josh is looking to see advance to the quarterfinal round. Look at this region, Cam, it's unbelievable! Any matchups that advance have a chance to be wildly entertaining. Adultery versus the Career Girls. Adultery versus Group Therapy. Group Therapy versus Miss Monopoly. Miss Monopoly versus the Career Girls. We're drowning in storylines out here. One of my favorite regions by far. I cannot wait to see which titles are going to be advancing after this round. Keep your eyes on this corner for sure. And that will round out all of the teams that will be competing in the third round. Before we go, I'll take us through some of our more surprising exits from the second round. Of course, we'll have to start off with the elimination of two of our number one seeds, those being WWB and 1-Upmanship. Both of these games were anticipated to do really well here, but some very tough matchups for both titles see them exiting in just the second round. Alongside them, we see two number two seeds eliminated here as well, with Time Control and the Oregon Trail card game both being sent home. The Oregon Trail got hit hard by an unfavorable matchup against the Career Girls. We were very surprised that Time Control also got taken out in its favored match against 15 Love. All in all, we are now left with less top seeds still in the tournament than out of it. And this has been felt by our bracket holders, as just these four losses have left 75 brackets without a champion. But for those whose champ is still in, let's see which games are the most favored by the public to go all the way. Among the remaining games, the Rock, Paper, Scissors game is the third most picked, championing 43 brackets. Adultery takes second, winning it all in 61 different brackets, and our most popular game picked to win it all is the Campaign for North Africa, representing a massive 89 bracket champions. With the third round starting, we'll see if one of these titles can live up to the hype, or if one of our sleeper teams can sneak in and bring it home for their respective faithful. These teams are the real deal, each having won two matchups in order to get where they are now. But now it's time to see who has what it takes to lay claim to their spot in the quarterfinal and whose tournament is ending here. Let us know below which matchup result surprised you and who do you think is poised for a deep run or shouldn't have even made it here. Get ready for the third round as we get one step closer to finding the worst board game of all time. Signing off for the NBGA, I am Cam Sandwich. Thank you for watching and have a fantastic day. How's 
it going dudes? Welcome back to the worst board game of all time, Community Tournament. We've just finished up the third round, so it's time to see which board games have won their matchups and fought their way into the queasy quarterfinal. These games have a lot riding on them, as they hope to secure that championship title for the brackets that had them winning it all. In terms of the bracket challenge standings, we see that Buy and the Bunny has continued to hold their first place lead over the field but there are plenty of brackets right behind them looking to snatch that first place position and the grand prize. Before we go over the third round results, I would like to go over a structural issue that was discovered in the big bracket and that has since been corrected. Due to a miscommunication with the bracket software, two regions positions in the big bracket were swapped. The only change this would have made to the matchups is in the semi-finals, so the real bracket looks like this. This will have no impact on the bracket challenge as it was only a visual issue with the big bracket here. We at the NBGA were thankful that this issue was found before the semifinal polls were published as it would have caused massive confusion. With that addressed, it's time to get started with the official declaration of the third round results. Once again, I am joined virtually by my color commentator, Joshua Jacobs. Glad to be here again, Cam. Can't wait to see how many of my predictions turned out wrong. Trust me, you won't be the only one. Let's head over now to the big bracket to take a look at the matchups and their winners. We'll start off as always in the Stink region where our last match of this area will see the Campaign for North Africa, The Desert War, 1940-43 taking on Public Assistance. Each of these titles secured big wins to get here, with North Africa eliminating its rival war game in the number one seeded war, and public assistance ending the magical Cinderella story of 15 Love. What we are left with is quite possibly the most brutal matchup of the entire tournament, with North Africa being seemingly unfazed while taking wins from tough opponent after tough opponent, and public assistance destroying every game it has gone up against so far. Unfortunately for our voters, this means it will most likely be very tough to choose which game they would like to move on, and with a large amount of brackets riding on these games as their champion, this clash of titans is sure to lead to glory for some, and ruin for others. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to welcome you to the best matchup of the tournament so far. Both of these titles were some of the first board games covered on this channel, and that's for a good reason. They are legendary! I mean, let's look at the welfare whack of public assistance. Making a game unbalanced on purpose is a creative decision, and it is a decision that you make to sacrifice the gameplay. Being in the working person's rut is an absolute slog, being filled with mostly negatives and locking you out of several catch-up mechanics that you use to try to hedge your losses. This was done on purpose for the sake of the theme, but if you're purposely making your players not have fun, they won't want to come back. Compound that with how it handles the theming, blunt as a 2x4 heinous space effects, Saturday night sections that encourage criminal activity, a jail system that only benefits the players inside, and a chance card collection that has both some of the funniest effects I've ever seen, and at the same time carrying one card so vile it would immediately ruin the night for all players. All across the board, this game is doing double time to make sure it can make it as far into the tournament as possible, and public assistance performances show that it is no slouch when it comes to this competition. At the same time, it is going up against an entirely different beast. This is not a board game. This is not a war game. This is the campaign for North Africa, The Desert War, 1940-43. The game no one has ever finished, holding a 20-year playtime if you schedule meetings in advance. Oh, you'd like to learn how to play? Have fun reading through the 334 pages of rules in order to learn the mechanics. Finally got those down? Now learn your country specific mechanics, like needing to upgrade the British Army's gas canisters because they were made of different materials at the time causing the gas inside to evaporate faster. Or Lord have mercy on your soul if you decide to play as Italy. A game so complex it couldn't be playtested, a flight system so broken even the creator says it's garbage. A game so confounding that Richard Berg himself told his players they need to stop playing and get a life. This is no mere game. This is the campaign for North Africa, The Desert War, 1940-43. And it's my pick to be the one to make it out of this region and advance to the semifinals. 
A spirited matchup starts off our quarterfinal round, but we still have six more games to meet that will be giving it their all to take home that championship crown. With the first quarterfinal matchup revealed, it's time to take a look at the two games competing in the Stank region. Our final battle from this section will see the Rock Paper Scissors game going up against Capital Punishment. Both of these games cleaned house with their competition, with RPS stopping an impressive run from Oy Vey and Capital Punishment ending the career of the People's Champion, the Vanilla Ice Electronic Rap Game. Now in the quarterfinals, each of these games will be looking to overcome their final challenge and break out of the region, with RPS riding its completely useless momentum that it used to carry it past some truly heinous titles, while Capital Punishment has used its dreadful theming to post convincing wins over some of our most fan-favorite competitors. While not as impactful as the last match, both of these games still have a lot riding on them in the bracket scene, so one wrong move from either title could spell disaster for their respective faithful. Both of these games have worked their boxes off to make it where they are now, but in my opinion, there is only one of them that can really make it out of this region. Let me explain why. Let's start with Rock, Paper, Scissors and what it brings to the table. Any meaningful changes to the Rock, Paper, Scissors formula? No. Any new ways to expand on the classic game? Nah. A price tag? You got it! You can play this game for free anytime you want. The only reason I could see someone wanting this is because they thought the plastic docks looked cool, which is fair, they do. Is it worth it? Not even remotely. Now let's look at the other game headlining this matchup, Capital Punishment. A lot of games this tournament have been leaning on their bad themes to make up for the fact that they've got nothing going on. Capital Punishment is unique in this sense because it is using its bad theming to distract you from what it does have going on. Genuinely good gameplay. Capital Punishment's gameplay, balance, and mechanics are all rock solid and make it an intense experience with a ton of strategy and tough choices. It fixed everything wrong with Public Assistance's gameplay, which is why it was seated seven spots higher than PA because unfortunately it has that working against it here. If not for Capital Punishment's obtuse theming, it wouldn't even have made the tournament, and while that theming has been able to carry it so far, I don't think that will be enough when it's going up against titles of this caliber. Call me crazy, but I think Cap Pun just has too much good in it to make it much farther than this, especially when you're going up against something completely and totally pointless. I'll be taking RPS on this one. With our first two matchups revealed, Josh will run us through a quarterfinal matchup he would love to see take place. I know I just predicted the complete opposite outcome in both games, but we are facing a rare opportunity here to experience the first ever Hammerhead Enterprises Bowl. These absolute mad lads were the creators for both Public Assistance and Capital Punishment, and their creations are both battling it out now for a chance to meet each other in the shabby semis. I'm sure it would bring them great joy to see their boys in such a high pedigree position, so I'm excited to see whether or not these two can pull off the improbable and bring out the family matchup we're all dying to see. And with that, we've now seen one half of the games competing in the Queasy quarterfinal, but we still have four more games that are ready to take a shot at making it to the shabby semis. It's time now to look at the bottom half of our quarterfinal game, starting off in the Stunk region. Our battle here will see What Do You Meme taking on Candyland. These two games have endured completely different storylines on their way here, with Candyland living up to its low seating by clearing through its lesser opponents, while What Do You Meme has spent the tournament fighting through Titan after Titan and thoroughly destroying them along the way. This has led us to a tough quarterfinal matchup between two games thoroughly despised by the community, so they are going to have a tough choice ahead of them when picking their winner. Call me crazy, Cam, but I feel like people have been sleeping on Candyland this entire tournament. We've been seeing a massive amount of coverage for What Do You Meme and the crazy run that it's been having, but hardly anyone has been talking about Candyland. This might truly be the only game in the bracket where the players do not matter. As soon as you're done shuffling the cards, the winner of the game has been picked. The only thing you're doing is slowly revealing who it is. In fact, there's only one way to change who the winner is going to be, and that's when you run out of cards and have to reshuffle. That is the only gameplay aspect to this title, and Candyland has been playing in this tourney just like it functions in the game. It's not putting on any flashy performances, it's not keeping the audience on their toes, it's showing up, putting a win together, and moving on. And really, that's all it takes. But there's a reason the other game here has been stealing the show, because What Do You Meme has been putting together an all-time performance. 
None of our models predicted what do you meme advancing this far in this manner, with the only remotely close matchup it's faced so far coming in its last matchup against Speak Out. Otherwise, it's been massacring really bad titles in their own right, so at this point people are wondering if it can even be stopped. Its biggest X Factor so far has been its ability to absolutely flop in its main goal of being funny, and its over-reliance on memes that were outdated even when the game came out makes this a lethal one-two combo. But is that failure at its main goal enough to propel it over a game where the players don't even play? I wish I could offer you an answer, but to that I really have no idea. This matchup could go either way, all I know is whoever comes out on top is going to be an extremely tough challenge to overcome. As we round out the Stunk region, we only have two games left, making their quarterfinal debut. It's time to reveal our last two Queasy quarterfinal competitors as we travel down to the Stonk region. The two games that will be competing for that last semi-final spot are Adultery and What Shall I Be, the exciting game of Career Girls. Each of these games took a convincing victory in our third round to get here, with What Shall I Be earning its third win in a row, scoring at least 70 points, and Adultery winning in the first match of the tournament where it has scored less than 90. It's clear who our bracket holders are thinking is going to be the one to reach the semifinals, but since both of these games have been very consistent throughout the tournament, our voters might end up coming to a different conclusion. The other regions need to pay attention because this is what a number one seed really looks like. Sheer dominance across the board. Absolutely atomizing its lesser matchups, and then when it comes across a real competitor like Miss Monopoly, still making it look like it wasn't even a contest. This game means business, featuring a dull spin of fest as the first half of the game and following that up with an innovative new gameplay feature. Other games with controversial themes usually use that for fictional events in the game. Public assistance has you commit fake crimes during gameplay, Oive has you marry a fake Dawn as a way to fake doctors. This title is different as the second half of the game focuses on committing real world adultery in real life. This is an actual crime in 17 US states. This thing can get you arrested if you play rules as written. What? Getting off that topic, let's move down to the career girls who have been no slouch in their conquest of the Stonk region. Big win after big win and showing no signs of slowing down, the career girls have leaned fully into what it considers the prime employment opportunities for women. Consider what its brother game, the exciting career game for boys, offers its players in the employment field. Scientist, doctor, engineer, astronaut. Now what do the girls have to look forward to? Airline hostess, nurse, model, ballet dancer, the premier in career opportunities. My favorite part is how they couldn't think up a way a person would become a model, so they just have all the girls go to the totally real charm school. This combined with the absurdly dull gameplay means the only enjoyment players are going to get out of this one is laughing at how obtuse it is, which is not at all what the game was going for. But will this immovable relic of the past be able to halt the unstoppable crime of the present? My guess is no, but I have been wrong many times before, so we'll have to wait and see the final results in order to find out. With our last two matchups revealed, let's have Josh run us through a semi-final matchup he would most like to see. I want to see the kids vs adults battle of the century, Candyland vs adultery. Could you imagine the champion of keeping children busy versus the very finest of bored adults desperate for some action? This would be the single most confusing poll that I would be able to imagine on that community tab. And despite how different these two are in everything, if you walked into a room of adults and asked them to play either of these games, you'd get the same answer of, no, what? Nothing but entertainment coming from this matchup, which is why I'd like to see them move on. And that will round out the complete pool of the quarterfinal round. Before we finish up, let's take a look at the most devastating losses felt by our bracket holders. A tough loss from a pretty high seed, Speak Out was eliminated by What Do You Meme in this third round. It will be heading home and taking the 15 people that had it winning it all along with it, which was one more bracket than the number one seeded War, who also went home this round. A much more widespread loss, however, comes from Miss Monopoly, who was unable to make it past adultery, leaving 35 brackets without a champion going into the quarterfinals. And while not represented much on the bracket side, we still hold a heavy heart in saying goodbye to two fan-favorite Cinderella stories, 15 Love and the Vanilla Ice Electronic Rap Game. 
While they served up some fantastic upsets during their matches, their competition sliced them out when they were unable to add in more points to return to the lead. These titles went to the extreme and showed they were cool as ice under pressure, giving viewers a good mind blowing with their performances. Their exits will be hard to swallow as we call a ninja rap to their stories and put them on ice. Ice, baby. Quite a sad sight for those affected, but for everyone else, it's time we begin our journey into the quarterfinals. These eight games have overcome monstrous odds to get to where they are now, and look to further prove that they have what it takes to become crowned the worst of the worst. Get ready for the queasy quarterfinals as we get one step closer to finding the worst board game of all time. Signing off for the NBGA, I am Cam Sandwich. Thank you for watching, and have a fantastic day. How's it going dudes? Welcome back to the worst board game of all time, Community Tournament. We've just finished up the quarterfinal round, so now it's time to meet the final four games that have survived and advanced all the way into the shabby semifinals. These games are the worst of the worst, the upper echelon of our competitors. And now it's time to see who will have the opportunity of a lifetime to be one of the final two games competing for that championship crown. But besides the title, we also have a lot riding on these games with the Bracket Challenge, which has seen an interesting development. For the first time in the tournament, Bai and the Bunny's lead is now split, as they are now tied with Yuri Man at 780 points. But there are plenty of games right behind them waiting for a chance to steal that top spot, with these last two rounds being worth massive pointage. And now it's time to see which games will bring those points home for their respective faithful, with the official declaration of the quarterfinal results. Once again, I am joined virtually by my color commentator, Joshua Jacobs. Pleasure to be here, Cam. Can't wait to see which of these bad boys can tear it up and bring it home. I'm just as excited as you are. Let's head over now to the big bracket and meet our winners from the quarterfinal round. To start off, we'll head topside for our high semifinal matchup between the winners of the Stink and Stank regions. Our first competitor will be the Stink region champion, the number 12 seed, the campaign for North Africa, the Desert War, 1940-43. This wargaming legend has posted an incredible tournament resume with recent victories including the number one overall seed War and one of the toughest matchups in the entire tournament against public assistance. These big wins have been hard earned as North Africa's complete disregard for your free time compounded with the bonkers nonsense off the wall mechanics like the pasta point have carried it through this tournament handily. And as it is the most represented game remaining in the tournament in the bracket challenge, it has brought home a massive boon of spoils for its faithful. But will they continue to be rewarded for their loyalty or will their champion fall here? That will be decided when it goes up against the champion of the Stank region, the number 5 seed, the Rock Paper Scissors game. This cash-in on the original children's classic has put an impressive run together in its own right, taking down tough opponents like Shoots and Ladders, Oy Vey, and Capital Punishment. Its main strength comes from the fact that it is just the single biggest waste of money you can come across, with a free version of this title available at all times for anyone with hands, and also available to those without hands if both players just say their selections out loud at the same time. As such, we have determined that the only useful part of the game is the score tracker on the side of the model, as it will be able to keep score for those not possessing the ability to count. This incredibly effective technique has brought swarms of points for those supporting the title, and they hope to continue to cash in with a huge victory here in the shabby semis. I'm gonna switch it up in this round. Instead of refreshing all the negatives we've already heard about these games, I'm gonna relay their positives to you in an attempt to convince you why you shouldn't vote for them. Let's start with the Campaign for North Africa, The Desert War, 1940-43. This is the absolute most thorough piece of board gaming in the bracket, with tons of mechanics in and around the real-world aspects of the titular North African campaign to add as much realism to the process as possible. And while some of the mechanics, like the flight combat, fall very short of stellar quality, most of them are well put together for a decent experience. 
It also fits those looking to participate in the extreme board gaming niche well, carrying a level of severe micromanagement to the war process that is sure to scratch the neurons of some of the brain itches out there. Of course, this is all just speculation, as the game was unable to be properly playtested, and I don't blame them, they wanted to release the game sometime that decade. But the fact that the game has fans that like the game enough that they complained about how the flight system is not as fun as the rest of it shows that there is at least some good parts to the title. Now let's move on over to RPS. As much of a waste this entire thing is, the dock itself is very well designed and pretty cool. Each of the players flipped up their protective shield to hide their choice, makes their selection, and then revealed all of their picks at the same time to see who wins. The handy dandy score counter on the side also constantly shows who's in the lead. Of course, what it offers besides this is jack all. But if you're going to steal an addicting gameplay loop, then there are definitely worse options than rock, paper, scissors. It's got that quick action gameplay that all the kids enjoy. It's just a shame that a cheaper, more widely available option has been sweeping the market for centuries at this point. Otherwise, it could have been a big hit. With our first semi-final matchup revealed, we are left with only two more games that have a shot at the championship match. We meet those two remaining challengers from the low semi-final matchup when we come back. This NBGA broadcast is brought to you from the loving patrons over at the deli. Our supplier, Flage. Our staff, Max Leon Thomas, Floris Leffler, and Benny Rush. Our chef, Matthew Connorth. And our investors, Ice92355 and Campbell Graves. Truly the greatest ride ever. The NBGA would also like to thank Cam Crim Productions and viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome back. It's time to take a look at the remaining two games that will be competing in the shabby semifinals in the low matchup. Our first challenger from this match will be the champion of the Stunk region, the number nine seed, What Do You Mean? This positively hilarious title has overcome the most difficult route to the semifinals out of any game. Facing Titan after Titan in every round, with the Game of Life, WWB, Speak Out, and Candyland all failing to take down the meme machine. It rides on the back of failing to accomplish its main goal of being a knee-slapping giggle fest. Partially due to its memes being outdated on release and its gameplay being a replica of much more successful Apples to Apples style titles. And while its following is the smallest of the remaining games, this is a tight-knit group that have faith in their champion to bring them back the points they need to make it to the top. But in order to do that, it will have to overcome an absolute monster in the champion of the Stonk region, the number one seed, Adultery. This lecherous pastime for players has seen one of the most dominant performances in tournament history, with it failing to ever score below 70 and being the only game to score 90 points, doing so twice. This title has been smashing through its competition on the back of its genuinely one-of-a-kind gameplay structure of spinning a spinner to collect tokens so you can get more time to do the title of the box in the second half. Those that support adultery are numerous, being the second most represented group remaining, and they are hoping that their champion will continue to pound the competition until it's the last game standing. Again, I'm gonna try to convince you why you shouldn't vote for each of these titles, starting with what do you mean? Sure, it may not be funny per se, but if you have a bunch of internet illiterate people with you, then this is a whole other story. Bad puns are not funny either, but the enjoyment from those groan-inducing beauties comes from how creative they can be and how much fun the person telling them is having. And if your 78-year-old grandpa or 6-year-old cousin makes an absolutely terrible meme but are chuckling it up the whole time, your cold dead heart just might end up cracking a smile. Plus, just like with RPS, if you're gonna rip off a gameplay loop, then there are definitely worse options than apples to apples. With your main crowd, probably not an option you'd ever consider, but with the right crowd, you might be able to get a smidge of enjoyment out of the meme machine. As for adultery... Uh, no wait, I got something. People keep saying in the comments that this title is meant for swingers or people of the polyamorous variety, which would remove the criminal aspect of the activity from the mix. Unfortunately, I don't think those groups would particularly enjoy their activities being meticulously timed and strictly enforced by a neutral third party, especially since there's nothing for you to do if you aren't the two people actively participating in the round two gameplay. Uh, 
you will get laid, although it will be randomized to with, and it will always be with two different people, so not much hope for a connection there. Also, you will have to convince several other people to play first, which is a whole other mess. Uh, your enjoyment with the game is largely going to rely mostly on how skilled your teammate is, and since they're chosen at random, there's no hope for pre-game strategy. Uh, you know what? If you're going for an STD any percent speed run, this is a great tool to make your runs more consistent. There you go, a positive aspect. What a freaking mess. And with that, we have revealed all four of the games that will be competing in the shabby semifinals. Before we go, we'll have Josh run us through a championship match that he would love to see take place. Cam, a lot of people have been keying in on the North Africa vs. Adultery Final, and that's why I'm gonna go against the grain here and say I'd like to see Rock, Paper, Scissors take on What Do You Mean? I'm picking this one because I genuinely have no idea who would win this matchup. In the other one, I'd probably give a slight edge to North Africa, but here, this is anyone's game. My guess is it would come down to which emotion is felt stronger by the public. Complete disdain for something utterly pointless, or what I can only describe as genuine festering hatred for the meme machine. And when these battles boil down to emotions, that is always an entertaining sight to see. So I'm hoping these two can overcome the odds and bring this matchup home for old Josh. That will be quite a sight to see, but before we can bear witness to our grand final, we first need to see which games will be able to overcome their competition and make it out of the shabby semi-final round. Get ready for the shabby semis as we get one step closer to finding the worst board game of all time. Signing off for the NBGA, I am Cam Sandwich. Thank you for watching and have a fantastic day. How's it going dudes? Welcome back to the worst board game of all time community tournaments. We've just wrapped up the shabby semi-finals, so now it's time to meet the two games that have fought their way through the entire field and made it to the grievous grand finals. These two have overcome the vast amount of obstacles in their way to be now on the doorstep of greatness and are now only one step away from claiming their title as the worst of the worst. Alongside the games, we also have our bracket challenge nearing its conclusion, with bracket holders watching with held breath as they hope that their games will be able to bring them the points they need to claim that top prize. Before our semi-final round, our leader was Bai and the Bunny, who managed to reclaim their solo lead, being the first bracket to surpass the 1,000 point mark. But will they be able to hold on to that lead through the turbulent semi-final round? That's what we're here to find out now with the official declaration of the semi-final results. Per tradition, I am joined virtually by my color commentator, Joshua Jacobs. Pleasure to be here, Cam. I cannot wait to meet our two championship competitors. Same here. Let's head over now to the big bracket and meet our winners from the semi-final round. We'll start off at the high semi-final matchup to meet our first championship competitor. The first game advancing to the grand finals will be the number five seed, the Rock Paper Scissors game. The champion of the Stank region has taken out the most popular selection to win the tournament in the campaign for North Africa, the Desert War, 1940-43 causing massive shockwaves to the bracket challenge that we will get into later. For now, let's focus on RPS and its unwavering commitment to being completely redundant to the Rock, Paper, Scissors experience. Those who have tuned in before are well acquainted with RPS's game plan of having a dock that technically adds nothing to the experience except a scoreboard. But an interesting new discovery is that there were actually multiple versions of the game sold. What I assumed to be the only version of the game was the one that came with four docks, so that you and all of your friends could play. But if the price tag was too high for some hot RPS action, then a smaller version containing only two docks was available at what I hope was a cheaper price. As for that price tag, the crowd has come up with somewhere in the $20 range for the privilege to play Rock, Paper, Scissors. But take that with some salt, however, as I have no idea where they got that number. All in all, RPS has been a huge success for all the brackets that picked it to win it all. It is just a matter now of completing the journey and bringing the title home to its bracket faithful. 
Josh here, ready to try to convince you once again why you shouldn't vote for the Rock, Paper, Scissors game. As both the disability aid and general fun of the RPS format didn't seem to work, I've got two new points that could be in favor of the title. First, it completely removes the ability to cheat. In what may be the only improvement this title made to the classic game, no amount of sleight of hand is going to be able to get past the protective shield to let you change your selection after you've picked. So if you've got a friend that you suspect has been cheating in every game, this game provides a solution. Is it complete overkill to purchase this just based on cheating suspicions? Yes, but it will be a 100% effective method in curbing the problem. Seeing as this has been the only legitimate benefit the game has managed to provide, the RPS fandom has taken to a new angle to try to prevent this title from moving on any further. That RPS shouldn't win because it's not a board game. These doubters consider the Rock, Paper, Scissors game to be more akin to a toy like a Rubik's Cube than an actual game, and as such, does not think it deserves to move on in the worst board game tournament. Unfortunately, based on our metrics, the argument falls just short as it reaches the game portion of the description by holding a contest with a winner and a loser, and while it doesn't include a traditional board, it does include peripherals that you use to play the game, similar to titles like Doggy Doo, Bean Boozled, and Adultery. It is very tough to come up with positives for games that make it this far into the tournaments, but I'm glad we could come up with at least the anti-cheating benefit so we could have at least one good thing for this completely useless piece of plastic. Now that we've fully covered RPS, let's head down to the low semi-final matchup to meet the game that will be going up against it. The other game that will be competing in the grand finals will be the number one seed, Adultery. The Stonk region champion has been completely unstoppable for its entire tournament run, once again scoring more than 70 points in its fifth straight game, taking down the meme machine. Those familiar with Adultery's moves know exactly why it has been so dominant, featuring one of the most insane gameplay loops in the entire genre, going from spinning spinner to actually getting it on with other players in just a few minutes. Some new perspectives were brought in against the title to shine more light on it as we look at the game from different points of view. Those that the game was not made for see this title as an absolute atrocity and an affront to both the board gaming sphere and decent morals in general. To compound that, those that the game was made for also won't enjoy it, as it highly regulates the entire practice with specific rules to follow, a set timekeeper to uphold those rules, and a whole lot of nothing for the other players to do while the two players are being regulated. As such, this has caused the game promptly into the who was this made for category, which has been an absolute blessing for the brackets that selected the title to win it all as it clears every opponent that comes its way. But it now must penetrate this final barrier if it wants to win it all and claim the crown of worst of the worst. Alright, this time I'm really going to convince you why you shouldn't vote for adultery. The comments have given me some new material, so let's get into it. First off, the rules of the game were written intentionally in a vague manner, probably so they could have plausible deniability. But as a result of that, the only objective of this game is for you to spend a good time with two players of the opposite sex. Because of this wording, there's actually no part of the rules that specify that you must engage in any sexual activity. You could simply have a heartfelt conversation, or play rock, paper, scissors, or whatever else your heart desires until your time is up. Not only removing the criminal portion of the game, but also allowing anyone the ability to play. The only issue here is that if this was your plan all along, why are you playing a game called Adultery? The game isn't called Light-Hearted Fun with Friends. You know exactly what you're getting into. Look at the cover of the box! Okay, a weak starting point, sure, but we're not done. Another point is that the STD risk is way lower than people might first think, because you won't be playing with just strangers, mostly people that you know. Besides the fact that you will still have to convince these people to play the game first, the notion that there is any board game out there where the chance of catching an STD is not always zero is a bad look. On top of that, the game does not come included with any type of prophylactics, meaning that if you want to fully protect yourself from disease while playing, you will need to bring in outside components to properly enjoy the game. That's like if you want to play a game of Bean Boozled, but you had to bring your own gosh dang jelly beans. Alright, alright, last try, my last resort. Look at this thing. 
a game called Adultery, made in 1969 with a naked woman and a funny looking guy on the cover? This would make for an incredible collector's item for people looking for strange board games. A piece of board gaming history that practically no one knows about but screams controversy? What a find! In addition to that, since nobody knows about or wants this thing, it is dirt cheap online for a game of its age. This thing fits the controversial board game collector niche perfectly, meaning we finally found a legitimate positive for adultery. After that spirited rundown, we have finally met both of our challengers competing in the Grand Finals. Josh will now give us his prediction of who he thinks will be able to claim that championship crown. This is a tough one, Cam, because both of these games are so bad, but in such different ways. Even the simple ways to gauge which game is worse fall short of the whole picture here. Which game would I rather play? RPS for sure, I don't swing that way. But which game would I rather own? I'll get a chuckle every time I see adultery. RPS is just gonna make me wanna throw it away. After taking every single aspect into consideration, I have come to the conclusion that I would never seriously buy a copy of Adultery. But at the very least, I do not already own the game. Therefore, purchasing this title would at least accomplish something. That same result cannot be applied to the Rock, Paper, Scissors game, which would just give you another copy of a game you already have at your fingertips. As such, I'm gonna have to go with the upset here and pick RPS to win just on the uselessness of it all. Greed is going to overtake Lust on this one. A major pick from Josh as we head into the Grievous Grand Finals. Before we wrap up, let's take a look at the bracket challenge and the interesting development that was mentioned earlier. As we all know, TCFNA TDW 40-43 was the most picked game to win the tournament. As such, it losing in the semi-final round has caused massive shockwaves to the bracket challenge leaderboard. But none of us knew how serious those shockwaves were until now. With the campaign's elimination, neither of our previous bracket leaders of Bye and the Bunny or Yuri Man are now able to win the bracket challenge. In fact, only two of our more than 600 brackets are now in a position to claim the grand prize for themselves, and it directly correlates to whichever game wins the tournament. At the start of this round, Jesset Liu was in third place, but by correctly guessing the RPS vs. Adultery final, they have now moved into first. And if Adultery takes the top spot, then Jesset Liu will hold on to the lead and claim the bracket title. However, 20 points behind Jesset Liu at the start of the round was Moose Meat, who did not predict Adultery to be here, but was the only bracket that had RPS winning it all that was close enough to Jesset's score to not be removed from contention. If RPS manages to win this matchup, Moose Meat will just barely score a little over 100 points more than Jesset, which will earn him the bracket championship title and the grand prize. All of our other brackets in the top 10 either had North Africa, What Do You Meme, and in one instance, Tic-Tac-Toe as their champion. A shout out to Sinzer for having a rest of the bracket so accurate that losing their champion in the first round still resulted in them making the top 10 near the end. But regardless, these brackets are now mathematically unable to get the points required to win and will soon be losing many of their top 10 spots to the bracket faithful whose champion brings home that glorious title. Everything is riding on this match as we enter the conclusion of this glorious tournament. Both of these games have put it all on the line, but only one of them will be able to take that final step into the light and claim its title as the absolute worst of the worst. Get ready for the Grievous Grand Finals as we take our final step towards finding the worst board game of all time. Signing off for the NBGA, I am Cam Sandwich. Thank you for watching and have a fantastic day. How's it going dudes? Welcome to the conclusion of the worst board game of all time community tournament. Our final two competitors have gone against one another to determine our grand champion. So now it's time to take a look and officially declare which one of them has come out on top. 
As per tradition, the final time, I am joined virtually by my color commentator, Joshua Jacobs. Pleasure to be here one more time, Cam. Let's get into it. Absolutely. Let's head over now to the big bracket to find out which game has won the grand final. Heading to the center of the bracket, we find our final two competitors, but only one of them was able to claim it all. The official worst board game of all time is... Adultery! The number one seed from the Stonk region had one of the most dominant performances in the whole field, but was challenged for the very first time in our final by RPS, ending up with its closest finish by a wide margin. It was able to hold on though, claiming the win and the title, as the Rock Paper Scissors game will have to settle for the silver medal. Adultery will leave this tournament with its head held high, a long list of victories around its belt, and a brand new title as the absolute worst of the worst. Alongside our champion, we also get the chance to fill out the final spot on the podium with our third place matchup. Bringing home the bronze medal will be the Campaign for North Africa, The Desert War, 1940-43. TCFNA TDW 40-43 was able to overcome the meme machine to bring home that consolation prize for all the faithful that stood behind it the whole way. A shame that we couldn't see it compete in the final, but this was a fantastic run for North Africa, and it should be proud of the season it's had and what it was able to accomplish. And for our final update, it is time to officially declare the winner of the WBGOAT Community Tournament Bracket Challenge. Of the more than 600 brackets submitted, only one stood atop the field, with the number one overall spot being claimed by Jesset Liu with 1,560 total points. They will be receiving the vintage 1973 edition of Pit used to create the Pit video for their victory. Congratulations to Jesset Liu! And with our winners declared, it is now time to say goodbye to the tournament. But that does not mean we are all done with the content. We would like to hear your ideas for what we should do next. Be that a loser's bracket to give your favorites another chance, a different bracket with an altogether different theme, or any other long-form content you would like to see us do in the future. Cam Krim Productions is also looking to get involved with other creators, so if you or someone you know is having trouble producing their dream content, reach out using the email in the channel description. Finally, I'd like to take this time to give a heartfelt thank you to everyone who participated in the tournament. It was a real blast to put together, and I'm so glad that so many of you were able to engage with and enjoy what I've been putting together here. I couldn't have done it without you all, so really, I just wanted to finish this off by saying, truly, thank you. Signing off for the NBGA, I am Cam Sandwich. Thank you for watching, and have a fantastic day.